Since the very beginning of time, humanity has gazed in wonderment at the moon, the sun, and the stars. The urge to reach out into the heavens and discover what lies in and beyond them has existed for as long as mankind has wanted to fly. But very many centuries were to pass before spaceflight became a fact. The engines are on. Four, three, two, one, zero. We have commit. We have off. The clock is running. It was to prove perhaps the most exciting field of all human endeavor. Those dreamers of centuries ago quickly realized that the main problem was how to propel themselves into space. 17th century French author and playwright Cyrano de Bergerac imagined races living on both the sun and moon. To visit them needed a power source to project his space vehicle. Some of them hit in some measure on its use and proposed fastening to it a quantity of squibs which carrying it by force in the air would serve it instead of wings and indisputably give it the appearance of a flying dragon. De Bergerac had identified the answer, rocket power. By the end of the 19th century, sci-fi writers like Jules Verne and H.G. Wells agreed that the rocket was the key to space's door. It was, however, a Russian physicist, Konstantin Eduardovich Tsiolovsky, who first looked seriously at the rocket as a means of launching people into space. He advocated the use of liquid rather than solid propellants because of their greater efficiency. In contrast, American physicist Robert Goddard pursued solid fuel rockets, initially as an improved substitute for weather balloons. Goddard, however, was the first to recognize the importance of the nozzle shape in achieving boost. But by 1928, Goddard had recognized that liquid fuel was the way ahead. Meanwhile, in 1923, a Romanian schoolteacher, Hermann Obert, had published a book, The Rocket into Planetary Space. This triggered much interest in rocketry, especially in Europe, where numerous rocket societies sprang up. To these enthusiasts, rocket power appeared to be the answer to everything, although sometimes the results were somewhat laughable. In America, Robert Goddard continued to build rockets. By the mid-1930s, with the addition of stabilizers and gyroscopes, they were reaching many thousands of feet into the sky and attaining speeds of up to 700 miles per hour. But the lead in rocketry was about to be taken over by Germany. For when the Nazis came to power in 1933, they embraced rockets as a possible future weapon system. In 1937, under the strictest secrecy, they set up an experimental establishment at Pinemunde on Germany's Baltic coast to develop new weapons. One scientist who went to work there was 25-year-old Werner von Braun, who had developed an intense interest in rocketry and space while a student. Von Braun was put in charge of Pinemunde's rocket section and by 1938 had developed a prototype, the A4. This had a range of 11 miles. After the outbreak of war in 1939, von Braun's research was slowed by Hitler's decision to transfer some of Pinemunde's resources to the Luftwaffe. Nevertheless, he continued to perfect his rocket. 
in spite of numerous frustrations. In 1943, with the war beginning to go badly for Germany, Hitler decided to give priority to his so-called revenge weapons. These included the V-1 flying bomb, also being developed at Pienemunde, and von Braun's rocket. Allied intelligence had, however, slowly become aware of what was going on at Pienemunde. In August 1943, it was attacked by British bombers. They caused some damage and forced dispersion of the V weapons program. This included moving the production of the V-2, as von Braun's rocket had now become known, to the Harz Mountains south of Hanover. Within days of the Allied landing in France in June 1944, Hitler unleashed the first of his V weapons. This was the V-1 ramjet-powered flying bomb, which was used in an offensive on Britain. Three months later, Von Braun's V-2 joined in the offensive, being operated from mobile launchers positioned in German-occupied Belgium and Holland. After launch, the V-2 reached a speed of 3,600 miles per hour and a height of 100,000 feet. Its range of 200 miles meant that with its one-ton warhead, it could hit targets in southern England. But the V-2 arrived too late to affect the course of the war. And in May 1945, Germany, overrun from both east and west, was forced to surrender. Von Braun himself, his arm broken in an accident, surrendered to the Americans, together with many of those who had worked with him. The Western Allies also seized the underground V2 factory in the Hartz Mountains. The Russians too captured rocket scientists, documents and hardware and took them all back to the Soviet Union. Then with the onset of the Cold War, both the Russians and Americans began to pursue rocket programs, initially using captured V-2s. By the early 1950s, with both sides now possessing nuclear weapons, Emphasis was increasingly placed on developing long-range nuclear rockets. But the use of rocket power for space travel was not forgotten. US President Dwight Eisenhower declared 1957-58 to be International Geophysical Year. During this period, which will actually be 18 months long, the scientists of the United States will join their efforts with those of the scientists of some 60 other nations to make the most intensive study ever undertaken of our planet. Both American and Russian scientists declared that they would put a rocket into space, but it was the Russians who were first off the mark. In 
On the 4th of October 1957, they launched Sputnik 1 into orbit around the Earth. People all over the world were captivated by the radio signals that it transmitted. But in America, the Russian achievement came as a total surprise, and many people were shocked. No, definitely not. I said we should have been the first ones to have it, if there's such thing. Because the American people are alarmed that a foreign country, especially an enemy country, can do this. And it, we fear this. We fear that they have something out that majority of the people don't know about. American discomfort was compounded a month later when Sputnik 2 went into orbit with a dog called Laika on board. Since there were no plans to recover her, animal lovers throughout the world were sharply critical. The American answer to the Sputnik was the US Navy's Vanguard satellite which weighed a mere three and a quarter pounds compared to the 1,200 pound payload of Sputnik 2. When it came to the launch of Vanguard on the 6th of December 1957, the rocket lost thrust immediately after liftoff, fell back onto the ground and exploded. America now turned to Werner von Braun, who was heading the US Army's rocket research team. He'd been developing the Juno rocket, and this was to be used to project the rocket-shaped Explorer satellite into orbit. Explorer 1 was scheduled for launch on the 31st of January, 1958, and the country waited and watched with bated breath. The launch was successful, and some American pride was restored. Both countries now saw placing a human being into orbit as the next stage of the race. But more information about the effects of space travel on the human body was needed, and the Americans used high-speed experimental aircraft, such as the North American X-15, for this. In October 1958, President Eisenhower announced the setting up of the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, NASA. This removed the wasteful competition that had existed between the Navy and the Army. Its civilian nature was also a signal to Moscow that America's space program was peaceful in intent. The next priority was to select people to go into space. Both Russians and Americans opted for fast jet pilots, since they were likely to be the most adaptable to space conditions. These included weightlessness. Seven American flyers were selected for what NASA called Project Mercury. At a secret center called Zvezdny Korodok, or Star Town near Moscow, the Russians assembled a larger team of what they called cosmonauts. A Russian space scientist stated the problems of selecting suitable candidates. Scores of precise tests were needed to determine the best physique, special knowledge, stamina, and ability to react quickly to unforeseen circumstances. Temperament and character were also the key problems. Meanwhile, space probes continued, with the Russians launching their lunar series of moon rockets, signaling that they were looking beyond near space. The Americans concentrated more on gaining better knowledge of the physiological effects of space on human beings, putting monkeys and other animals into orbit. But under the cloak of launching rockets deep into space, the Russians were also concentrating on a more immediate agenda. 
On the 12th of April, 1961, an SS-6 intercontinental rocket stood ready for launch. A young Red Air Force officer, Yuri Gagarin, sat inside the Vostok spacecraft attached to the rocket. He later described the sensation of liftoff. I glanced at my watch. It was seven minutes past nine Moscow time. I heard a shrill whistle and a mounting roar. The giant ship shuddered and slowly, very slowly, lifted off the launching pad. The rocket's huge engines were fashioning the music of the future. This is the BBC Home Service. Here is the news. All Moscow is waiting to give a hero's welcome to the world's first spaceman, Major Gagarin of the Soviet Air Force. Major Gagarin was sent up in his four and a half ton spaceship from somewhere in the Soviet Union. As he looked Gagarin completed one orbit of the Earth, seeing it as no one had before. Gagarin became an overnight international celebrity. Russian Premier Nikita Khrushchev was not slow to take advantage of this for its propaganda value. Gagarin undertook a world tour and was adulated by hundreds of thousands of people wherever he went. Once more, America had been surprised. But newly elected President John F. Kennedy stepped in, vowing that an American would land on the moon by the end of the 1960s. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win and the others too. The first American to go into space was Commander Alan B. Shepard on the 5th of May, 1961, just a few weeks after Gagarin. All right, uh, lift off and the clock has started. Yes, sir, reading you loud and clear. He was to spend only 15 minutes in space before making a successful splashdown in the Atlantic. U.S. Air Force officer Gus Grissom, who followed him on the same duration of flight in Mercury 4, two and a half months later, almost came to grief when the hatch blew open after his capsule landed in the sea. Grissom's experience was a reminder of the risks involved in spaceflight. Not until February 1962 were the Americans able to match Gagarin's achievement. The honor fell to John Glenn, who was launched into space in Mercury 6, courtesy of an Atlas rocket. Glenn made three orbits of Earth. He later summed up his feelings. I don't know what you can say about a day when you see four beautiful sunsets, three in orbit and one on the surface. This is a little unusual, I think. So America had its space hero. But the next American astronaut, Scott Carpenter, experienced some problems in space and eventually landed 125 miles off course. The following year, 1963, saw the Russians achieve another space first. Valentina Tereshkova was the first woman in space. It would, however, be almost 20 years before another followed her. Once again, Nikita Khrushchev was keen to extract the maximum propaganda value from this and was guest of honor at her wedding to fellow cosmonaut Andrian Nikolaev. <laughs> 
The next significant stage in spaceflight was the development of the multi-seat spacecraft, with the Russians unveiling Voskhod in 1964. It was, however, no more than a stripped-out Vostok. Voskhod had its maiden flight in October of that year. Conditions were so cramped for the three men who flew it for the first time in October 1964 that they could not wear spacesuits and there were no ejector seats. Nevertheless, Voskhod 1 spent just over 24 hours in orbit. Retro rockets were used to cushion its landing back on Earth. Voskhod 2 was launched in March 1965 with just two men on board. An airlock had been installed in place of the third crew seat and once in orbit, Alexei Leonov maneuvered himself into this and from there emerged to spend 10 minutes in space. Thus the Russians achieved yet another space first. The American equivalent of Oshkot was the two-man Gemini spacecraft, and first to fly it were Gus Grissom and John Young. They took Gemini 3 into orbit five days after the Voskhod 2 flight. Then in June 1965, Ed White performed the first American spacewalk. Subsequent Gemini flights perfected many of the techniques which would be needed for a voyage to the moon. At the same time, unmanned moon probe programs were underway, with the Russian lunar series concentrating on landing an instrument package on the moon's surface. After several abortive attempts, Luna 9 succeeded in this in early 1966. The equivalent American programs were the Ranger and then Surveyor series. Ranger carried a battery of television cameras to transmit pictures of the moon's surface, while Surveyor, like Luna, made landings. All this activity meant that the prospects for landing a man on the moon were growing brighter. But both the Russian and American moon programs now suffered setbacks. The Russians had two heavy lift moon launch rockets in development, the N-1 and the Red Army's Proton. Intense rivalry between the two and indecision over which to select imposed delays in the moon program. Worse, in April 1967, the Russian mooncraft Soyuz malfunctioned on its first flight. Its parachutes became entangled during the re-entry phase and pilot Vladimir Komarov was killed in the resultant crash. This set the moon program back still further. The American lunar program was named Apollo and a command module in which the first Apollo astronauts would travel was delivered to NASA in August 1966. On the 27th of January 1967, Grissom, White and Chaffee, who were to make this first flight, climbed aboard the command module for a final launch rehearsal. A communication problem delayed matters. The astronauts then reported an electrical fire on board. Suddenly, before they could evacuate the module, it exploded and all three perished. It seemed as though John F. Kennedy's vow to put a man on the moon before the end of the decade had become an impossible dream.
The setbacks suffered by both the Russians and Americans deterred neither in their burning ambition to place human beings on the moon. The Apollo command module was redesigned, and this was used in Apollo 7, which was launched in October 1968. The three-man crew of Walter Schirrer, Don Isley, and Walter Cunningham spent 10 days in space, and this helped to put the American moon program back on track. The momentum was kept up by the fact that the lunar module, in which the astronauts would actually land on the moon, was now nearing completion. Apollo 8 went a step further orbiting the moon no less than 10 times over Christmas 1968. Not that the astronauts on board were impressed by what they saw. I know my own impression is that it's a, a vast, lonely, forbidding expanse of nothing. And it certainly would not appear to be a very inviting place to live or work. The Russians, however, were continuing to experience problems with their launch rockets which suffered a number of accidents during tests. The one consolation that they had was that they did achieve a space docking when the two-man crew of Soyuz 5 transferred to the unmanned Soyuz 4 and returned to Earth in it. By March 1969, the complete American lunar module was ready for its first flight. Apollo 9 was used to evaluate it. All now seemed set for the ultimate challenge of a moon landing, but one final check was needed. Consequently, in May 1969, Apollo 10 was used as a dress rehearsal. On board were astronauts Stafford, Young and Cernan. They carried out a successful docking between the command module, nicknamed Charlie Brown, and Snoopy, the lunar module. In contrast, the Russians suffered another setback when their new super booster caught fire and exploded just after launch at the beginning of July. This left the field to the Americans. Neil Armstrong, Michael Collins, and Buzz Aldrin were selected to fulfill President Kennedy's May 1961 vow. Early on the 16th of July, 1969, they made their final preparations. Apollo 11 lifted off. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. All engines running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. 32 minutes past the hour. Liftoff on Apollo 11. As they flew towards the heavens, the hopes of millions of people all around the world went with them. The launch rocket had three stages, which were discarded in turn as the fuel was exhausted. Three stage cut off. SQ has ignited. We can and the thrust looks good. All engines, all sources show the second stage is burning perfectly. The third and final stage took the lunar and command modules close to the moon before separating. The two modules would then orbit behind the moon and the final phase would begin as the lunar module, now called Eagle, separated and descended to the moon's surface. Apollo 11 reached this stage after four and a half days of flight. Over. Go. Capcom, we're go for landing. Eagle Houston, you're go for landing. Over. 
Six and a half hours after landing, Neil Armstrong climbed down the Eagle's ladder. That first human footprint on the moon was to become one of the most famous photographs of all time. As for being on the moon... It has a stark beauty all its own. It's uh, like m much of the high desert of uh, the United States. It's uh, different, but it's very pretty out here. We're... Yes, it's Columbia on the high gate, over. Roger, the EVA is progressing beautifully. They're setting up the flag now. I guess you're about the only person around that doesn't have TV coverage of the scene. The Stars and Stripes was duly planted. Buzz Aldrin later described the sensation of walking. I remembered what Isaac Newton had taught us two centuries before. Mass and weight are not the same. I weighed only 60 pounds but my mass was the same as it was on Earth. Inertia was the problem. I had to plan several steps ahead to bring myself to a stop or to turn without falling. All too soon, however, it was time to depart. The lunar module was reunited with Michael Collins in the command module so that the journey back to Earth could begin. The astronauts landed in the ocean southwest of Hawaii. Helicopters were quickly on the scene to extract them. They were flown aboard the aircraft carrier Hornet, where President Richard Nixon greeted them. Summarize it because I don't want to hold you now. You have so much more to do. And... Gee, you look great. You feel as good as oh, you look. Oh, you feel great. I feel just perfect, Mr. Yeah. President. Yeah. Are you? I understand your Frank Borman says you're a little younger by reason of having going into space. Is that right? Do you feel that way, a little younger? We're a lot younger than Frank Borman. <laughs> <laughs> Thus Aldrin, Armstrong and Collins completed humanity's greatest adventure to date. Apollo 11 was however by no means the end of the US moon program and during the next three years there were a further six Apollo missions. the lunar astronauts carried out further exploration. To help them, a vehicle, the so-called moon buggy, was developed to enable them to range further afield. The astronauts also collected several hundred pounds of moon rock. This was taken back to Earth for analysis. The Russians, on the other hand, continued to send unmanned probes to the moon. 
and used a vehicle, Lunachod, remotely controlled from the Earth. But space still had its dangers, as the crew of Apollo 13 were to find out in April 1970. The launch went smoothly enough. One, zero. We have commit and we have liftoff at 2.13. The Saturn V building up to 7.6 million pounds of thrust. It all seemed routine. 13, we've got one more item for you. We'd like it to stir up your cryo tank. Okay, stand by. Houston, we've had a problem here. This is Houston, say again, please. Yes, sir. Uh, Houston, we've had a problem. We've had a main B bus undervolt. Roger, main B undervolt. And we had a pretty large bang associated with the um, caution and warning there. Okay, now let's everybody keep cool. We got the uh, lens still attached. Let's make sure we don't. The service module oxygen tank had ruptured and fuel cells failed. Tension mounted as ground control wrestled to find a solution that would bring the three astronauts, Jim Lovell, John Swigert, and Fred Hayes, safely back to Earth. Standing by, over. After six days in space, the crew eventually landed back on Earth, to the intense relief of millions who'd been anxiously watching the drama unfold. The crew of the Russian Soyuz 11 were not so fortunate. Their spacecraft lost pressurization while re-entering the Earth's atmosphere in June 1971, and all three cosmonauts were dead on landing. In December 1972, the last Apollo mission, Apollo 17, took place. Eugene Cernan and Harrison Schmidt spent three days on the moon, collecting nearly 250 pounds of samples. When they came to depart, they didn't know that they would be the last human beings to visit the moon to this day, 25 years later. The truth was that the moon program was becoming prohibitively expensive, especially for the Americans, suffering as they were from the high costs of the war in Vietnam. Consequently, both Russians and Americans switched the emphasis of their space programs. Now they concerned themselves with developing the ability to live in space for long periods of time. To this end, the Americans launched three Skylab missions during 1973-74, with the crew of the last spending 84 days in space. The Skylab crews had to learn to cope with prolonged weightlessness. You do have a sense of up and down, and you can change it in seconds whenever it's convenient to you. If you go from one deck to the other and you're upside down, you say to your brain, I want to be that way up. And your brain says, okay then, that way is up. It's strictly eyeballs and brain. As to what the achievements of the Skylab missions were for the crews. It looks like you'll be in pretty good shape. I think the biggest major accomplishment in this uh, mission is the length of the stay. We've shown that man can uh, do what we thought he could do, and that is come up here and, and set up housekeeping in space. The Russian equivalent was the Salyut program, which culminated in 1984-85 with Salyut 7. Cosmonauts spent no less than 237 days on board orbiting the Earth. 
When they eventually vacated it in October 1985, Salyut 7 continued to orbit until eventually crashing into the sea five and a half years later. The cosmonauts themselves returned safely to Earth, little worse for their record-breaking stay in space. The 1970s also witnessed a mission which marked a new era of international cooperation in space. Apollo and Soyuz simultaneous launches in July 1975 resulted in the first meeting between American astronauts and Russian cosmonauts in space. By the late 1970s, an increasing number of satellites were being deployed in space. To launch, and if necessary, repair the satellites as well as deliver astronauts to space stations, the Americans developed the reusable space shuttle. The first of these, Columbia, made its maiden manned flight in April 1981. We have a mission. We have a mission after solid rocket boosters and liftoff. Liftoff of America's space shuttle. Once the shuttle had completed its mission in space, it returned to Earth, landing just like an aircraft. Numerous space shuttle missions were mounted during the next few years. However, when it came to launching satellites, the Europeans stepped onto the sea with a rival system, the Ariane rocket, which began to compete for business with the shuttle. At the end of January 1988, the space shuttle Challenger stood poised for launch. Selected for the mission were six professional astronauts and one civilian. This was Krista McAuliffe, a school teacher. She'd been selected the previous year as a civilian spokesperson, independent of NASA, for the shuttle program. Challenger duly lifted off. We have main engine start. Four, three, two, one, and lift off. Liftoff of the 25th Space Shuttle mission, and it has cleared the tower. But one minute into the flight, things began to go wrong. A sealant ring on one of the boosters failed. Flames burnt a hole in the main propellant tank of liquid hydrogen and oxygen. This caused a rupture, and the shuttle exploded, killing all on board. This tragedy caused a hurried redesign of the shuttle, but the program was continued and does so to this day. Meanwhile, the Russians had been concentrating on a replacement space station for Salyut. This was Mir, which was launched into orbit in February 1986. Mir has been described as the first permanently manned space station, with cosmonauts spending increasingly unbroken amounts of time in it. Indeed, sometimes they were on board Mir for over a year at a time. For the next decade, Mir continued its operations, with astronauts from America, courtesy of the shuttle, and other nations spending time aboard it. By 1997, however, Mir's age was beginning to tell. In February, there was a fire on board. Then, four months later, an unmanned cargo ship destroyed some of Mir's solar panels during a docking operation which went wrong. The crew were left with just emergency power supplies. Matters were made worse when the onboard computers kept failing. 
it looked as if a massive space rescue operation would have to be mounted. But eventually the crew, which included British-born Michael Fole, managed to get most systems functioning again. The truth of the matter was that Mir should have been replaced by the new International Space Station Alpha, but the development of this was running behind schedule. Following a pause after the end of the Moon program, space exploration has been reaching out into the universe once more. During the 1970s, there were a number of programs undertaken to explore other planets. The Russians launched a series of rockets at Mars, which transmitted information back to Earth. The American Mariner 9 orbited the planet during 1971-72. During 1975, Viking 1 and 2 managed to place landers on Mars. These had small laboratories on board and sent back not only black and white pictures of the planet, but color as well. In the late 1970s, the Russian Ventura and American Pioneer series explored Venus. Other probes began to reveal the secrets of even more distant planets, Mercury, Jupiter, Saturn and Uranus. The longest of these voyages was made by the American Pioneer 10, which was launched in March 1972. Sending back faint signals to Earth, it flew past Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus and Pluto before leaving our solar system in 1983. Since then it has continued to fly on ever deeper into space. 1990 witnesses setting up of the first permanent astronomical observatory above the Earth's atmosphere, the Hubble Space Telescope. However, an optical defect meant that Hubble initially did not have the design degree of resolution and its images were disappointing. Therefore, in 1993, the Space Shuttle was sent up with a repair team. They succeeded beyond all expectations in fully overcoming the malfunction. Their efforts have enabled us to add considerably to our knowledge of the universe. But perhaps the most exciting space event of recent years, and one that has done much to rekindle global interest in space exploration, has been the Pathfinder mission to Mars, the Red Planet, which was launched in October 1996. On board Pathfinder was a small robotic buggy, Sojourner, which would be used to hunt for rocks which might reveal evidence of extraterrestrial life. To safeguard the equipment on Pathfinder during its landing on the 4th of July 1997, a parachute was used, retro rockets, and finally, cushioning airbags. Once on the ground, these deflated. Pathfinder then opened up like a flower to reveal its sensors. A ramp came down and Sojourner began its work. Pathfinder was soon sending back superb pictures of the Martian surface. But Pathfinder is merely the first of an exciting new series of space exploration programs, which will continue into the 21st century. Indeed, many more years of exploration will be needed before we fully understand the universe in which we exist, let alone the infinite space beyond it.